Hey everybody, my name is Amanda Ziba, the creator behind the channel Learning with the Word Nerd, also an author and a teacher. I'm making this video specifically for the students at Spencer Middle School in Iowa as they write their fractured fairy tale stories, but anyone looking to learn about point of view and perspective and how they can impact and influence the story specifically as they're writing, hopefully you'll learn something too. All right, let's get on with the show. Okay, let's start with a little review on point of view. Point of view is a story element that tells us more about the narrator, whether they are inside the story or outside the story watching everything happen and then telling us about it. There are three different kinds of point of view. First person uses pronouns like I, me, mine, and it is someone who is inside of the story telling us what's happening, but only from their perspective. We get to know their thoughts. We get to know what they see and experience, um, but we don't get to know what other characters are thinking unless those characters say thoughts out loud. So first person, big clue, I, me, mine, um, lots of personal emotions and thoughts. Second person isn't used all that often. It's uh, in fiction. More often it's used in instructional manuals, cookbooks, um, things that are telling you how to do something, um, putting you in the driver's seat, you as the reader. Um, and that is the, the pronoun that you're going to see the most often in those types of books. And then the third kind of point of view is called third person. And it's when somebody outside of the story, a narrator that is not an actual character, is sharing the story events. And you will see pronouns like they, them, he, him, she, and her, letting us know what is happening. We get to see different uh, character experiences and perspectives and thoughts. Uh, we can even see what's happening in a couple different places at the same time with third person. Um, but each of these has their merits. And before we talk about that, I'm gonna show you some examples of each one in action. This first person example comes from The Running Dream by Wendelin Van Janen, an amazing book. And if you haven't read the whole thing yet, you should totally get a copy and do so. All right. As I read, listen for the cues and clues that let you know this is a first person narrative. Chapter one. My life is over. Behind the morphine dreams is the nightmare of reality, a reality I can't face. I cry myself back to sleep, wishing, pleading, praying that I'll wake up from this, but the same nightmare always awaits me. Shh, my mother whispers, it'll be okay. But her eyes are swollen and red, and I know she doesn't believe what she's saying. My father? Now that's a different story. He doesn't even try to lie to me. What's the use? He knows what this means. My hopes, my dreams, my life. It's over. The only one who seems unfazed is Dr. Wells. Hello there, Jessica, he says. I don't know if it's day or night, the second day or the first. How are you feeling? I just stare at him. What am I supposed to say? Fine. He inspects my chart. So let's have a look, shall we? He pulls the covers off my lap and I find myself face to face with the truth. All right, now even though there's the occasional pronoun he and she in there, we know that this story is told in first point, person point of view because Jessica is sharing her thoughts and we see lots of pronouns like me, my, I, um, and it is like thick with emotion. Um, definitely a solid example of first person point of view. Earlier, I told you that second person point of view doesn't often appear in fiction, but I did find one example uh, where it did. This excerpt comes from The Lost Jewels of Nabuti by K.A. Montgomery, and it is a choose your own adventure story, which means that the author writes it as if you are the main character. And not only are you uh, getting to experience the story through reading it, but you get to make choices along the way to see how the story will play out and how the story will ultimately end. This excerpt comes from a ways into the story, but um, that's not important. Again, we're just using as an example. And as I read, I want you to listen for the cues and clues to let you know that this is written in second person. Your instinct tells you you should give the ivory piece to the beggar woman. You drop it into her outstretched hands. The moment the ivory piece is in her hands, she leaps to her feet yelling in a high-pitched scream, aye! that brings two short, wiry men in hooded robes out of a small door in the wall. One of them shouts in English, We are your friends. Follow us. The other man wrestles with a huge man who drove the limousine. 
for a moment, you half decide to run alone. And then you go with them through the dark tunnels and streets deep into the Medina. You haven't the faintest idea where you are or what is going on. The ivory piece seems to have a strange and powerful effect upon these people. In here, it is your new guide speaking. Seated at a small table is an old man with white hair and a beard. He's smoking from a water pipe. Rugs are everywhere, hanging on the walls, rolled up, stacked in piles. Could this be the rug merchant that Peter and Lucy talked about? Sit down. Do not be frightened. You sit. We have followed your trip from Boston. We know who you are and we want the jewels. Now give them to us. But I don't have the jewels, you protest. The old man rises and looks sharply at you. Look in the pocket of your coat. You obey him and begin to fumble in the coat pocket. And then at the bottom of the page, this is where you would get to choose. If you find the jewels in there, turn to page 63. If you find nothing, turn to page 64. So again, it's the pronoun you and having yourself be the main character and in the action um, that lets us know that this is a second person point of view example. And finally, last but not least, we're going to talk about third person point of view. Our example comes from Uglies. It's the first book in a series by Scott Westerfeld. Um, as I read, again, listening for the cues and clues to let you know that this is third person. New Pretty Town. The early summer sky was the color of cat vomit. Of course, Tally thought you'd have to feed your cat only salmon flavored cat food for a while to get the pinks right. The scudding clouds did look a bit fishy, rippled into scales by a high-altitude wind. As the light faded, deep gaps of blue of night peered through like an upside-down ocean, bottomless and cold. Any other summer, a sunset like this would have been beautiful, but nothing had been beautiful since Paris turned pretty. Losing your best friend sucks, even if it's only for three months and two days. Now, again, we know this is third person because we get a lot of character names and there is no I, me, my, uh, Tally's not talking to us directly telling how she's feeling. A narrator is telling us what she's seeing, what she's experiencing and what she's thinking. So we know that it is third person. When you change the point of view, you change the mechanics and grammar of how a story is told. When you change the point of view, you're actually changing the narrator who is telling the story. And when you change the narrator, you're changing the pronouns that are used to tell that story. You're also changing the distance from which events and emotions are experienced, both by the characters and potentially by the reader. Let's look a little further into this. You might be wondering why an author chooses one point of view over another or how they choose one point of view over another. They all have their benefits and we're gonna talk about them right now. If an author chooses to use the first person, it's likely because they want to show intense emotions and personal thoughts and experiences of a singular character. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but many, many books that are written for middle grade readers and young adult readers use the first person because you, as a reader, spend a lot of time thinking about yourself. And it's not that you're selfish. It's just that you're trying to figure out how to do life as you. And it doesn't leave you a whole lot of room to think about how other people are doing life. And so it reflects the main age of the character of their target audience. Okay, so lots of emotion, uh, personal thoughts, reflection, coming of age stories, which are very popular for your age group, um, use first person. Second person, the author wants to make the reader a part of the story, feel like they are right there in the thick of the action. Again, the choose your own adventure was a great example of that. Third person is often a very popular choice, and that's because the author can show the thoughts and the actions of multiple characters at one time. They get to share all facets of a story, and they're not really limited to only what one character knows and sees. So for stories that have a lot of characters or where a lot of characters' opinions and um, actions influence the story, um, Third person is really important um, and helpful to them. A really great example of third person is Harry Potter. Okay, that is told um, from a third person point of view because we get all of the characters' thoughts and actions and we need them all in order to understand that story. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so this was just a quick rundown on point of view, a review of this concept. If you need more practice with this, I'll put a link for this resource that I have on Teachers Pay Teachers so that you can get an even better understanding of it and practice with passages and also movie trailers. Most fairy tales were originally told from the third person point of view. I know that you've been asked to create a fractured fairy tale, taking something familiar and making it new. The fact that everything kind of started out the same with this third person point of view means that there are a lot of options for you to twist and explore and discover as you write your own version. But point of view is only part of it. We're also going to explore perspective. So let's take a look at that now. Perspective is kind of like point of view, but it's a little bit different. Perspective is the way a character's perceptions, values, and opinions affect a story. The experiences of a character's life give them a distinct way of perceiving the world, which in turn shapes the way a narrative, aka a story, and the way it's told. It's kind of like using different camera lenses. What lens is a character bringing to a story? How do they see the things around them? And how is that different or unique or distinct from the way another character might see it or tell a story? That's what we're going to be digging more into next. When you change the perspective, you change the lens through which the narrator tells the story. All of these things on this list can influence a narrator's perspective. Their attitudes, their past experiences, their personal beliefs, which can extend to cultural beliefs, religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, uh, their personality traits. A person who is shy might tell a story differently than a person who is outgoing or um, obnoxious. Uh, a person's status in society can reflect the way that they tell a story. Maybe they have a lot of responsibility or maybe they don't have all the rights that they think they should have. Those pieces of their life are going to influence the way that they tell a story, influence their perspective. Birth order. Think about a story that's told in your family all the time and how the oldest child in the family might tell the story and the youngest might child might tell that story or how the middle child tells that story. Everybody's got their own perspective, their own version um, or view of the events. A character's strengths and weaknesses might also influence the way they tell a story. Another good way to think about this is to think about a character or narrator's motives, their fears, and their dreams. That's the kind of lens that they're going to be looking through when they tell this story. Think about what's important to them um, and let that be a lead or a guiding factor for you as you consider your character slash narrator's perspective. Often the best way that I learn is by seeing how other people accomplished a task. So we're going to do an example here together to show you different perspectives. Let's think about the classic story of Cinderella. We know that Cinderella was forced to be a maid in her own home. We know that she gets help from her fairy godmother. She goes to the ball. She marries the prince. And she lives happily ever after. Now let's look at how some different perspectives can keep that same story, but give it a nice twist. The first book we're going to look at is Cinder by Marissa Meyer. If you haven't read this book, it's the first in the Lunar Chronicles, and it's amazing. If you want to try it out, I have a First Chapter Friday video of it on my channel. But this story is also told in a third-person point of view, just like the original Cinderella. However, it gives a twist in perspective on the main character of Cinderella because she's not a maid in some European countryside. She is a cyborg on a faraway planet and there is a plague happening and so by giving her the job of a mechanic instead of a maid she has different experiences she has different skills and these impacts the plot because instead of cleaning and scrubbing floors she's repairing androids and she happens to be repairing the android of the prince and that's how they meet initially and so that job put her in a different place that slightly adjusted and changed the plot line. So it's slightly different, slightly fractured, giving the whole story a different spin. The second example is Stepsister. And in this one, they change it because they change her personality. In this story, Cinderella is the evil stepsister. Okay, normally we hear about all the other sisters and how they're so bad and so mean to her. But in this version, 
it's Cinderella who's the mean one. And with that little perspective switch on her personality, it changes the entire story. That one is also still told in third person point of view. So same point of view, different perspective. The third one, Just Ella uh, by Margaret Peterson Haddix is told in a different point of view, is told in first person. But in this one, Cinderella is a prisoner. She isn't a lucky girl who finally gets to live in the castle and all of this luxury. She is a prisoner because she gets there and she finds out that the prince is kind of dim-witted and dull and she doesn't actually really like him and she wants to leave and she can't. And so by changing the dreams or a different character's personality, we have changed the perspective of Cinderella. We've changed what her hopes and dreams are. We've changed her situation. So the story has to follow a different path. Let's think about how we can apply what we've learned to your writing and to your story. I want you to ask yourself which point of view and perspective will best help you tell the kind of story you want to tell. Now, I know I introduced and reviewed point of view first, but I want you to think about perspective first. What kinds of perspectives will give your story a unique vantage point? Consider unique life experiences, strong personal beliefs, underexplored statuses in society. So here's a quick little thing. I uh, have an idea to tell a story about a World Series winning baseball team, but I want to tell it from the perspective of the person who's in charge of laundering all of the uniforms. That's, that's a perspective that probably hasn't been shared before when you think about winning the World Series, but that's somebody's full-time job is just to watch the uniforms. But like, I don't know much about that. And I think that it would be an interesting look at the situation. So, so think about the story and think about whose version hasn't been heard yet. Kind of like that, that three little pig story by John Sheska. Um, when we hear it from the wolf's perspective, whose perspective hasn't been heard yet. Okay. Underexplored character um, or status in society. Then once you've picked your perspective, then you can decide, do you want to tell your story in first person, second person, or third person? Let's continue on. I have a few more ideas to share with you, but I'm getting really excited right now, and I hope you are too. As I was thinking about your assignment for a fractured fairy tale, here are some of the ideas that I came up with. Think about an unexplored or previously unused setting or time period that impacts who the character is. Like we were talking about Cinder, okay? Cinder as a mechanic. What other jobs could you give or occupations could you give your main character that would completely shift the situation? Or maybe a different setting, like what if your story happened in the Old West? Or what if your story happened underwater? What if your story happened far, far in the future? How would that change your story? You could also consider it from an untold side character's experiences. We talked a little bit about that already, so I won't uh, go further on that, but kind of like the example I gave before, Stepsister by Jennifer Donnelly. You could flip-flop an opposite personality of a well-known character, which we've also already talked about. You could put a familiar character in a new role or status or occupation. You could lean into the fantasy genre and create a character that is part monster or magical creature. For example, in Disney's Beauty and the Beast, which is a very popular fairy tale, um, those characters come to life. Lumiere is a candlestick. Cogsworth is a clock. How could you make a character something different, something magical, that would then impact the way the story is told and the events of the story? Um, and then uh, one last idea is you can make the narrator someone unexpected. Uh, I know the book thief isn't a fairy tale, but in the book, the book thief, the narrator is the angel of death. Um, death is telling the story and what a unique perspective death has to offer to World War II. So think about who could maybe tell this story that would be super surprising and then let that character's perspective influence the way the story comes out. Before I turn you loose to work on your project, I want to offer up a few final tips. Number one, you don't have to start at the beginning. And I'm sorry, teachers, I'm sorry if this wrecks your plans for the whole story mapping thing. But um, oftentimes I will start with the thing that is most exciting to me, the story spark of an idea that got me excited about writing in the first place. And then I will write that scene. And then I'll think about 
what else I want to happen in the story. And then I will write that. And then, then that might lead me to be like, ooh, I totally know how this is going to end. And I want to write that. And then once I have a few scenes written, I piece them all together. And then I think, okay, how am I going to get from here to here? How am I going to get from here to here? And, and then I put it all together that way. But starting at the beginning, how does this story start? Sometimes I can feel so overwhelming and daunting and the start is often not the best place to start. So think about what made you excited about your current idea and then write that scene first and then let it build and grow from there. Another thing you can do is you can use a mind map, take what's going on in your head and make it visible on the page and then see where your ideas expand and explode. Um, talk your ideas out. Some of us are verbal learners. And so just chatting about ideas with a friend can be more helpful than writing something down. Also, if you like the blank page scares you, just get out your phone if that's allowed or open a Chromebook or and go to a new Word document and click dictate and then just start talking out loud, talking out your story, pretending like you're the movie narrator saying what's going to happen out loud and then use those initial words um, to be the foundation of your story and revise from there because sometimes looking at that blank page is really scary. Also, think about how you write best. I personally uh, think best when I handwrite. I can type faster than I can think. And so for me, typing a draft is very stilted. There's a lot of starts and stops, but it takes me longer to write out a sentence than it does to think of the next one. And so that's a much better flow for me. Pay attention to what works well for you and lean into that. Um, another tip is to look at stories you love and deconstruct them. It's not copying, it's learning. So if you, for example, loved the book Cinder by Marissa Meyer, think about what did I love about the story? What made me want to keep reading um, and turning the pages? What made me love Cinder as a character or Kai? Um, and then then do that with your work. Obviously, you can't copy the story word for word, but think about what are the good parts and how can I do that in my own way? Um, another tip is to remove all distractions, okay? Turn your phones over, minimize all the windows, turn the sound off on your phone. Um, I like to listen to instrumental music while I'm writing because it kind of does a white blanket of noise over everything else. Like, uh, you know, the neighbors who are getting a new roof or the dog or the people in the hallway or the person tapping next to you that drives me crazy. The instrumental music just kind of blocks all of that out and let me focus on my work. Uh, sometimes setting a goal, perhaps like writing for 20 minutes uninterrupted or a word count goal. Uh, I want to get to 500 words by the end of class. Um, these are ways that you can motivate yourself, kind of make it feel like a game. Um, and get yourself making some progress. And then the final thing is just to have fun. I know that this is school, this is an assignment. You didn't really maybe personally pick to use your time doing this, um, but this is your way to take something uh, typical and familiar and expected and turn it on its head and put your own personal spin and flair on it. Um, and, and when in life do you get to do that? Uh, you know, get free reign like that. So. I hope that you have fun with this writing exercise. I hope that this video has been helpful. Um, if you've got questions, email me. I'd be happy to talk you through more of it. Um, that's it. I'll see you later, guys. Happy writing and happy reading. Thanks so much for visiting my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. Please like this video and subscribe. Then be sure to check out the rest of the content I have for you on my channel, including First Chapter Friday videos, brain breaks, and more. Happy reading and happy writing. I'll see you again next time.